Hi everyone, welcome. I believe we were supposed to be more people, but it's 1040, and to be able to do the program that we organized, I think we have to stop. My name is Mehdi Shams. I am one of the facilitators of this workshop, and it's almost three years I've been working with refugees. And Iraj is the other facilitator, and he worked much more longer, much longer. We could, in the last three years, to support 26 Iranian and one Ghanaian refugee, and successfully, all of them they received their deportation order, and all of them they stay. We don't want to take this credit for ourselves because they were lawyers, they were MPs, they were uh, media newspapers. Iranian community, Gambia community that is very small, and also I have to say the government, because we believe uh, immigration, Canada doesn't want to deport uh, Iranian refugees uh, to Iran under this situation, but they have to follow the law, and they are very happy to see that people like us are engaged and support and to create awareness and this is the will of the community and people that these refugees stay. This is the nice part of the story. But there is a sad part also. All these refugees that stayed, they went through a lot of mental torture, stress, a lot of expenses, and family problems. And the main purpose of this workshop is to create the awareness about that part in Canada, we believe this part is useless because all of them, in three last years, there is no deportees, forced deportees to Iran. There were a few, around 40 of them, but they were voluntary. When we know that this is the result, we are asking why we shouldn't change something. And our purpose is to work with people and we have the plan to work with immigration officers and to clarify that, and maybe we can change. During this uh, workshop, we are going to follow the journey of a refugee when he leaves Iran, when he goes in a second country waiting, a long, long waiting to have his uh, permission to come in the third country, that in our case is Canada. And the last part is going to be Canada, what we did uh, in the last three years. And there are other things that I want to say, but I prefer to keep them for now. And later, I will just, uh, talk to you that this workshop, the preparation of this workshop, it was a workshop for ourselves. And we could go deeply in the meaning of the truth, reconciliation, and engagement. This is the theme of this symposium. And I hope that we can share it with you in this workshop. Thank you. So welcome everyone. I hope you guys are going to enjoy this uh, workshop and hopefully you will have something to take with you and end of the workshop. Um, I'm Iraj, and uh, so Iraj Rezai. I'm a coordinator of the International Federation of Iranian Refugees in Canada. We have a branch in the different country too, and all over the world. And so we just saved uh, refugees from deportation, maybe hundreds um, in the last um, 25 years. After the revolution in Iran and the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran got the power, the International Federation of the Iranian Refugee uh, realized that uh, they have to build something to uh, support refugees and in different countries, so we just uh, have a relationship with the immigration and the, in Turkey, this is neighbor with Iran, and this is the most of the Iranians come to Turkey to uh, get the permission and uh, claim to the refugee and UN, United Nations. Um, so we're gonna start with the, um, some, I hope you guys had a chance to take the advice from the, from the table over there. If you don't have a chance, take one please. Here, 
Oh, you did all of them. I guess they're all gone. They're all gone. No more. No more. No more. Why don't we share one? Um, is there no more dice? No more dice. It's okay. Have a seat, please. Um, so, so um, who has a dice? Lucky, and we will see what will happen after who doesn't have a dice. <laughs> All participation in this workshop will have equal rights and will be treated equally. Everybody happy with that? Isn't it? Is that good rights to have an equal right? As a human being, as a human right, having equal right in some place give you good feeling, proud of yourself, whatever you are, who you are, doesn't matter. You have an equal right from the everybody has besides sitting beside you or the other people. This room people who participate in this workshop has an equal right. We guarantee that. You don't have to worry about anything. New legislation will be Light colored clothing or glasses will be dismissed from this workshop. Oh. So whoever, whoever has glasses? Glasses, unlucky. lucky. <laughs> and light colors. Oh. Again, unlucky people. What's happening? We promised to have a good right here. But we got the legislation. As a facilitator, as a government, I have a right in the legislation. They give me the right. I'm in power. So, but you guys are not going to have to worry about it. It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> there is a chance. Whoever has a dice will be exceptional from this legislation. Who has a dice and has a light color and glasses? Hands up, please. Oh, so you guys so lucky. You guys stay in the room. The rest of the people will be dismissed from this room. But what happened to the first legislation? We said it could right. Am I treating everyone equally? No. That the legislation is coming and crossing the other right, other right. Many common citizen in Canada or each country, the government is telling you you have a equal right as the other people have it. Citizen. It doesn't matter if you're born here or you don't want born here. But where is common their discrimination? I don't know, we should think about it. As a group, we think about it. Why? Is it discrimination? Is it discrimination? If it is, how we can deal with that kind of thing as a citizen of Canada, as a citizen of the other country. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, short icebreaker. Uh, next is the movie we watching together. It is extremely difficult to find the proper words to describe what really goes on in Iran. Mathematical concepts such as numbers and statistics have lost their true meanings when it comes to violation of human rights in Iran. Observers who have been following human rights violations in Iran must have noticed an upspring in public and semi-public executions in Iran in recent days. Younger generations only know well about the rise in the number of prisoners being tortured and executed within the last two years in Iran. But 2014 saw about 800 reported executed and tortured prisoners. However, noting only these executions is disservice to Islamic regime of Iran. From the very first day that this regime took power, it started discriminating against everyone that was not Shia Islam. This is a very systematic discrimination that is encoded in the Islamic regime's legal system. Thousands of women have been murdered and prosecuted by ways of stoning, acid attacks, 
and public floggings. Millions of Iran citizens that have different beliefs than Islamic regime's belief have virtually perished. In all of its 36 years of being in power, Iran's Islamic regime has imprisoned, tortured, and executed hundreds of prisoners each year for other non-political so-called crimes. Many hundreds for adultery, for the LGBT community, for religious changes from Islam to another religion, atheists, political activists, and even journalists. It has dismembered thousands of people's hands, fingers, feet, eyes, and other organs in so-called retaliation for their petty crime and an eye for an eye. Hundreds of thousands of Iran's Christians, Jews, and Baha'is have been forced to leave Iran. Many of them were prosecuted daily in the hands of different sections of armed forces. In the next couple of years, it executed thousands more, this time of minority Kurds and Turkmens. In the next 10 or so years after that, it started executing political descendants and workers' activists who had been involved in workers' councils. Some estimate put the numbers of descendants that were executed to over 50,000. In the last month of summer of 1988, after accepting the defeat in the hands of Iraqi regime, Iran's Islamic regime hanged more than 4,000 political prisoners. Many had served their sentences and waiting to be released. However, their bodies were never returned to their families. This was a devastating massacre. Labor strikes are banned and declared haram. Workers that participate in strike actions are being prosecuted and their leaders are often jailed and publicly flogged. Iran's prisons are overcrowded. Systematic torture to gain information from prisoners is a part of Islamic regime's daily practices. What was discussed here was only a fraction of extreme cases of human rights violations. In face, all these people have not backed down. Struggle to end this barbarity is a major part of people's daily activity in Iran. This workshop seeks to explain why millions of Iranian men, women, and even children are refugees asylum seeking in other countries. But most of these refugees have been deported back to the Islamic regime of Iran, and their lives has and will be in serious danger. So I have to apologize for the bottom of the song here, but the reality is happening. I know it's very sad, I know it's touching part, and I know even watching this is a, it's a very um, sad and so it's, it's not easy to watch it. And imagine living in this society and living in this situation, the poverty of the death of the government. And I'm apologizing again. Um, this part of the workshop is going to focus on questions and answer any question you have about the movie, about the refugee situation, or any question about the this part of the movie. Is there any support system in place for those that are trying to help? Can you mention like um, helping to Iranian people in Iran or refugees out of Iran? Well, both. But both. both. Yes. Um, we believe in any refugees, we start from this. After the, uh, the revolution and then the execution and giving the power, Islamic Republic of Iran got the power, many Iranian people forced to live, as we mentioned in the book, I mean, the clip. And they come to different countries with the hope and um, like lots of expectation from the, the, the government, we believe, um, believe in the, you know, the refugees' rights and uh, uh, respecting the human right. But unfortunately, after the coming, we're going to focus on the, what was happening after they leaving the Iran. Coming to Canada or Europe or any country, there is a long process and they not being successful and the claim is, you know, is uh, rejected. We believe in Iran there is no human right. And this is the violation of human rights in Iran, forcing people to leave. Any deportation should be stopped, and Iran should be one of the countries on the list 
no deportation, no returning any people who speak in the land. Should be in the one of the, one of the other norms, uh, our government agenda to focus in, there is no change, nothing after the, any, uh, 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 any uh, elective. There is no change in government. It's the same against in human rights country over there. Our goal is our government respecting all Iranian who is fit Iran to stay and be safe in the second country. Yes. Our was if some of these people are from the government and seeking for refugee come to this country and put other people's lives in this here and in Iran. If they are from the government, this is my personal uh, belief from, uh, as a uh, quarter of the Iranian National Federation of Iranian Refugee. This agenda are the big is if from the government and hand bloody, they should be arrested and be in the court and whatever is court decided should be happy. But there is a, after the revolution, some people skip from the government that give them any involvement with the execution or torture or any of this, we believe they should have a right to be as a refugee. If, because we know all country has a, you know, the well, power to, to search and find out the background or you know, the, anything from the people is coming to, to the to different country to, as a refugee. And they have the ability to find out. If they find out their people, these people is not involved with any crime, any execution, any torture, any bloody hand, I think they have a right to stay there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Yes. What, what is the, uh, why is the government of Canada denying refugee status to people from Canada? They're denying you know, because they believe in, in their court, refugees coming and lying, not saying <coughs> As a refugee, you go to the to the to the, uh, to the uh, interview. I was a, a president of Iran. When I went to the uh, interview, I remember exactly. I'm not putting any government down. I'm not saying anything against any government. I'm saying the system remind me when I went to the Iranian government and they uh, had an interview. And they, 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 they put in the prison. They question looking for something like uh, not matching to other world, even one world, even time, even anything they think you are lying. You, you should be able to tell your story step by step, step by step, and then if one one specific small mistake, they try to make a conference. Honestly, I was interviewing and I feeling, you know, the other side is the people sitting to try to find what is my weakness, what is my, what, what's my point is not matching the other stuff I'm saying. Unfortunately, it's like that. And then the people coming to with the stress, with the lots of, you know, danger things happening to them, they are, they are afraid, they are scared, they are nervous, they, they are not coming to the party. They're coming from the death government, skipping the country on the road, they get tortured, they get raped, they get you know, all of the you know, money taken away. Or so many things happen in the way after they leave. And they are not in the good psychological uh, ability to answer specific questions. Like, um, so that's what I can say. And, and there's no way to prove your statements because you can't get evidence out of the home country. Right. They, 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 when they are asking you, they're looking at you, they're taking everything from you. They just, you can't, even they going after your family. They're forcing them to ask you to go back to the country, and they just jailing them, put in the jail. Right. Your father, your brother, they're just, um, you know, firing them from if they have a government job, if they find, for example, taking my mother-in-law so many times in the middle of the night, at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, they call and said, we're coming to take you for just car ride. Just scary. She's 65. That time she was 60, probably five or six years ago. They're taking for the ride. The police come, they're not, they're, they're, they're on the car box. They don't have any sign, anything. The car is a regular car. Open the door, get inside, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. 
all the women taking the right. Oh, just want to talk to you. So how are you doing? How you got to swim? So why is not coming back? You're not gonna do anything to him. Scary, scary. We can force to the people. They they are all. They have nothing to do. Anything I did. It. Anything I did. I was political activist and I did my job. I tried to for human right for any right for women's right, children's right, workers' right as a you know as a political activist. But nothing to do with my mother-in-law, nothing to do with my brother-in-law, nothing to do with my brother. They take over there, they fire me from the job, 20 years working, in government work, teacher, anything like that. And they take him, you know, to the jail, a couple days to stay over there. Nobody can ask questions, why you take him to the jail without criminal court, like without charge. They can keep them months and months over there, and they don't answer anyone. I want to add the point to uh, I think uh, to your question why the Canadian government doesn't take refugees, uh, I believe uh, unfortunately today uh, there is no universal human right. Otherwise, all of us saw the two boats, I think 1,600 people died in the coast of Italy. Uh, and this is happening every day. Today, because of the uh, economic situation, everybody, including Canadian government, thinking about how they can make money. It's not anymore about human rights. Where is the, uh, those places if human rights being violated? We have a responsibility as a human right, as a government, to bring uh, refugees in. Unfortunately, this is not the case. That's why millions of refugees, they lose everything they had uh, to just uh, save themselves and, uh, and their family uh, to go somewhere, but they end up, uh, end up in the uh, seas and we saw their bodies. There was a time when the government acted more generously towards refugees. I think of the South Asian experience from Vietnam in the 80s, where many Vietnamese were accepted and sponsored by the government as well as people who, and groups who said, we'll sponsor some people. Somewhere in the 90s, something changed. And it seems like the government has decided to be very restrictive about refugees. And so, you know, the government are elected by the people. So somehow your message, the message from this seminar, needs to get out so that the average person understands the question of human rights. That, you, that message has to go out to the communities at large because it's the government who was reacting to people saying there's too many refugees. And then they said, I guess something, well, there are safe countries where if you, if you leave a dangerous country, go to a safe country, we're, we're not going to take it. That, that was new rules, right? I'm taking one more questions, so I'll just like my time is over. So any more questions? Any comments or questions? It, it, it seems to be a, a bit of a uh, how to say, conflicting part of the story in there, which is that um, there are these issues, there's this threat of getting okay, you know, seven people back, and not just to Iran, but other countries, right? But you said that you don't think that people at the immigration camp want to send people back to Iran. Where's, if, if people don't want to send people back to Iran, and you're talking about the law, so where exactly, precisely, is the issue? In my understanding, the question is the government forcing the, the who's the activists or refugees to different countries to come back to the country, and you're telling me they, people doesn't send them, when the government doesn't send them? Well, you were saying earlier, I th if I heard correctly, I thought you said that people at Immigration Canada don't want to send people back. Yes. Did you say that? Yes, I continue to say because 26 cases is enough for me to realize that Canada doesn't want to send them back because they know perfectly what it goes there. So that there sounds like a disconnect somewhere. So somebody's, somebody's got on the book, on the books, laws that, that are, to, to your point, around Canadian policy around refugees changing, which it has. Right? Um, and yet, your experience is that some part, you talk about the government, the government's complex. There's a ruling political party. There's Immigration Canada bureaucrats. 
And then there are frontline staff who go and pursue people on the street. So which, which part of that infrastructure are you seeing not eager to send people back? This is, uh, you know, the law uh, order to deportation. The, the law of the same country keeps them here. Yeah. It means this is the understanding they have to have about the laws. Right. Laws is not the way that we think it is. It all depends on the person who's going to apply it and to understand it, to interpret it. The purpose of this workshop is to create this understanding of people that they are applying the law to realize, because they have a freedom, the way they apply the law is not two times two equal four. If they have the officers of the immigration, if they have this understanding and knowledge about what it goes there, I'm sure they can apply the law, but they can interpret it in other ways. Who are in favor of the immigration? for refugees uh, is a team of interviewers who think they're um, interviewing these refugees or one person. And if there is <coughs> one of those people Iranian, because that would be very exciting to have one Iranian person in the team of interviewers. Because they have better understanding. It is about decision making of people's lives. And uh, I don't know the procedure exactly, like how it works. Like one person interviews or a group of people? I'm going to ask uh, the whole the refugees here to answer their questions. So how many people? Is, I wasn't getting to you here, so. Uh, I interviewed by the judge. He was not Iranian. I cannot remember his name. It was 2010. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah. but I searched on the Google thing. He's not Iranian. He's maybe yeah. Canadian or whatever, he was the different person, but one person interviewed me here. In different country I was there, they interviewed the different level. One, the, the first level was by the immigrant office, uh, refugee immigration officer. I don't know who was it, but it was the lady, she was Swedish actually. But in my experience, I never uh, faced with any Iranian in during the interview. Because the, Interpreting is not right because it's like you go to South Africa and talk about Canada's weather. They can imagine it, but they cannot feel it, right? So it's very important to have one Iranian person, like be neutral, but at least be one of us to have that understanding of what is going on. Here.